right um welcome welcome everyone just confirming if you all can hear me you could give me a thumbs up those viewing on youtube you could um type on the live chat if you can hear me loud and clear so we're about to start um kickstart the event great awesome so let me just check through youtube if you all can hear me loud and clear as well All right, awesome. Okay, great. So we'll just be kickstarting today's event. Well, welcome once again. Thanks for joining in. And it promises to be fun. It promises to be an insightful conversation that we'll be having today. And we'll just do a brief rundown of the agenda. But before we get started, I'll be introducing myself briefly and also be introducing Women in Blockchain Africa, in case you are hearing about us for the first time. But in order for us to have a, uh, an easygoing conversation with less dis distraction, um, please try as much as you can to mute your mic. This for those who are joining via Meet and those who are joining via um, YouTube who are streaming live right now. Please do well to treat everyone with respect while chatting and do not make use of um cuss words while sending in questions or interacting as well and like you know this session will be recorded so let's try as much as we can to mute our mics and stay put next item would be a brief introduction like i mentioned about myself and you also would uh, want to introduce yourself using the live chat so i'm Berna Zominu, the team lead and founding member of women in blockchain africa and um, you could do a brief introduction about yourself. You could tell us your name, where you are viewing from, and what you're currently into, your career pathway as well. If you're a beginner, intermediate, um, advanced, you could also share that. I want the fun thing about yourself if you might want to add that as well. So do that um, using the live chat. I'll be viewing, uh, going, heading over there right about now to check some of your comments and while you are doing that please do well to take a screenshot share the link to the youtube live via um, your diverse social media platforms or you could also um, share with your network via your whatsapp status your linkedin profile and whatever social media platforms your platform you are active on so while you're doing that if you are yet to follow us on our social media platforms. You can see that right now on the screen. Do well to follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and general community if you are an African lady. So while you are doing that, let me head over to YouTube and um, see how the comments are going. Yes, so I'm heading over there right now. And at any point you are, Unable to hear, please also yes. in the case. Mm -hmm. All right, I can see Mumbai. Please do well to tell us where you are streaming from as well. So I can see Emmanuel, I can see Rixi. Please do well to also give us a bit about yourself um, so that we get to know who Rixi is or who. Mumbai is. I hope I pronounced pronounced that correctly. Awesome. So keep up, keep up with the chat, keep up with the engagement, keep up with the introductions. I'll be heading that there um, in a few as well to read other people's introductions. Yeah. Okay, so while we are doing that, I'll be giving a brief introduction about women in blockchain Africa. Like I mentioned earlier, many of us um, are pretty much unaware as to what we do and who we are. But then Women in Blockchain Africa is a blockchain awareness platform. And what we are focused on is that we empower from the name young girls and women through blockchain technologies. And we have a mission to train 2 million female, pla uh, female blockchain talents in Africa within the next 10 years. And it's beyond just training these young ladies and these women. It's also more into making them participants, contributors, and delegates in the blockchain space. So if you know any young lady or woman living in Africa or from Africa, you want to um, 
who are interested, all we need is your interest and we'll be able to ignite your interest and translating it into um, making you delegates and contributors in the blockchain ecosystem. So do well to call any lady on board. I'm still, I'm, I'm just trying to re-echo the fact that if you're yet to bring, uh, share with your network, please do well to do that because that's what we are about, making sure that we are able to bring on board as many ladies and young women as we can. And yes, at Women in Blockchain Africa, we offer numerous programs and we, um, some of which we just categorize into three, the mentorship program, the networking program and incubation. So part of our net a mentorship program involves us organizing career development um, events, one-on-one um, -on -one mentorship. And we also do train the trainee um, where we make sure we retire or should I use the word now, um, make a, a, a mentor who is someone who is advanced in the space, be a lead or mentor someone who is a pretty much a newbie and finding, trying to find fits in the blockchain space. So those are um, the category of, these are the category of programs that we run under the mentorship arm. And we also offer networking events such as what we are having now, webinars, um, conferences, networking, where we just gather with young women and girls together and we discuss and, and share your pain points, blockers that you might be facing in the blockchain ecosystem. And another one we do offer is the incubation program. And under the incubation program, we have um, hackathon uh, where we um, well, young ladies collaborate together to build amazing and exceptional blockchain products, trying to find ways to solve problems, so, so, pro, um, building projects that solve problems in the Africa space. And uh, blockchain projects, especially, we also do Web3 as well. Um, they also build Web3 pro projects and innovations likewise. And you do not want to miss out of all of those programs that we do offer. They, they, we, have numerous, we have had numerous programs in the past, and to be updated, that was why I mentioned earlier, you should not fail to follow us on socials and even join our community. So yeah, these are some of the things that we do run. And I hope with this said, you've been able to get your eyes full, uh, get a brief as to what we are about and what we do at Women in Blockchain Africa. So before we dive right into introducing our speakers, I just want to check a game via chat and to see those who have been able to introduce themselves or who have introduced themselves. Yeah, I can see Sayasa Asaf. I'm so sorry if I'm unable to pronounce your name correctly. And he is joining in from Rwanda. I can also see someone who is joining in from, who is a Web3 developer and enthusiast. And um, I want to track inclusion in this amazing ecosystem. That's a beautiful thing. And please do well to also introduce yourself um, in between our conversation. I'll be heading over to the chat to also read out some of your comments. So um, I think the next item on the agenda would be, oh, I failed to read the agenda briefly. I'll just head back, right back to reviewing the agenda so that everybody is up to speed. And um, the, to kickstart the agenda, I just did a welcome address where I shared brief, a brief about Women in Blockchain Africa. And next, we'll be having the panel session with some amazing and exceptional experts in the blockchain ecosystem. And then we'll be seeking questions and answers from the audience, those who are viewing live right now on YouTube. And right, right after that, we'll be drawing the, down the curtains. So this is not a long event, but it promises to be insightful, like I met, mentioned it promises to be exciting as well so at this point if you are yet to grab your notepad and your notepad and your pen pardon you might want to do that right now because we'll be introducing our speakers briefly and right on to we'll head over to the main conversation and the meat of today's meeting so i'll kick start by introducing calling on board um, the first speaker that i have here on my list which is sharon Sharon Moringi is the Comms and Community and Partnerships Lead at Kumasi Kamusi Dao. So uh, if you're there, please just unmute and tell, let's hear from you briefly. Just a brief introduction. <laughs> I, uh, I, hope, I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. 
Uh, great. Um, so my name is Sharon. Um, I am from Kamusi Dao. Kamusi Dao uh, basically aims to simplify Web3 terminology and then translate it to Swahili. Uh, apart from that, I am also the communications director for Beatrice Builders, and uh, I'll tell you a bit more about what we do, but Beatrice Builders basically, um, so Beatrice Builders, sorry, I can't see my screen, okay. So my camera is on, I trust. Uh, Beatrice Builders, they train uh, Bitcoin developers uh, within the within Africa and the global south. So we'll be talking more about that and the work we do in both companies. I'm, I'm so happy to be here, thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction and it's great to have you here. Next on our list, we'll be calling on board Katrin Lep photo. I'm so sorry if I'm unable to pronounce that. Please, I stand corrected. And she's the Executive Director of Global Partnerships at VX Technologies. So, um, Katrin, if you can hear us clearly, please, you might want to do a brief introduction about yourself. Absolutely. Good morning from Johannesburg, everyone. And I'm happy Holy Saturday for those who are Christians and celebrate Easter. My name is Catherine Leporto. I represent, I'm going to be wearing two hats in this particular forum today. Firstly, I'm the executive director for global partnerships at a company called VX Technologies. VX Technologies is a blockchain records, verified records company. I am one of the shareholders in the business. It is a company registered in the United States. I am based here in Johannesburg. My responsibility is to grow the business on the African continent. Recently, I've just now started taking on a new hat, uh, which complements what we're doing at, uh, at uh, VX. But this hat is from a company called Bitmobile. And with Bitmobile, we are bringing the first uh, blockchain smartphone of its kind to the African continent. In that manner, I am. Uh, I have the responsibility of senior vice president. Thank you. It's really great to be here. Thank you so much, Catherine, for that amazing introduction. And uh, while we are waiting the order of our speakers to join in, I think we'll just dive right into some of the questions that we have curated already, and um, want to hear your thoughts as well. And in between, when we other of our speakers join in will do a brief introduction and have them on board as well. So yes, I'm heading back to the chat and trying to find out how many of us can hear. And you could also feel free to add what you are looking forward to gaining from this session as well. So I'm heading there in the next few minutes. I can see someone heading and calling up Sharon. You're welcome to joining us. And yeah, I can see if she, I'm not sure where you're joining from. Please do well to indicate via chat. I can see Risky saying she's joining from Kenya. Awesome. So let's keep the chat um, buzzing and let's keep up with the engagement while we are also calling and sharing the link to um, every young lady and girl, a woman, woman pattern that you know. So quickly, um, instead of boring everybody, I will just right, head right into some of the questions that we have curated. I know you did a brief of introduction earlier, but um, I want us to like give uh, an elaborate um, conversation or elaborate introduction about what you do, your role, and the organizations that you manage or that you lead. So I would head over, I'll start with um, Sharon briefly, then we head over to Katrin. Yeah, Sharon, you're muted. Oh, sorry. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned earlier, my name is Sharon, Sharon Marugi, and I am from Kenya. Um, so I am representing two uh, organizations today here. Uh, the first is Beatrice Builders. Um, so the thing about Bitcoin is we have been so much of the consumers and much of the building is happening outside uh, the global south. And, uh, you know, as the people with the most use cases for Bitcoin, then it begs, it begs the question, I mean, who's making the products for us? Do they understand our problems? So part of that is why we were uh, 
Bitras was inspired to start training Bitcoin developers because from the data, um, it usually shows that uh, most of the builders are in the global north. Um, and that doesn't really, you know, suit us, especially when it comes to building solutions. Um, so uh, we do it in three parts. Uh, first is, uh, you know, mentor, mentoring uh, dev young developers. Uh, another is training developers, uh, Bitcoin developers to be specific. And then after that, there's also the hackathons where um, we help, uh, you know, build solutions. Uh, like the last one that happened was uh, in collaboration with the Africa Bitcoin Conference, uh, which uh, happened last year in Ghana, uh, December. Yeah. So the next one is Kamusi DAO. Kamusi DAO, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, aims to simplify web three terminology. Um, so you find that uh, a lot of you know web three uh, lingo is usually very uh, technical. So we aim to break down uh, to a simple, uh, you know, simple and relatable examples because most of these are usually new words. Um, new ones that we haven't experienced elsewhere so we find something relatable so that the people can understand this way it's easier to you know increase adoption uh, well while at it uh, there's also the translation aspect and it aims to uh, reach out to the swahili speakers um swahili in africa is actually the second uh, la you know largest language in africa so you know, in this case, we are we are reaching out to a very huge audience, and yeah, you know, aiming and there is again the goal of adoption. So yeah, those are the two companies. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's great to hear that um, the technical side of blockchain is being attended to, and people are trying, especially for people finding difficulties understanding. So now you know your go-to person in terms of getting um, getting the skills that you need to develop in your technical, the technical side of Web3 and blockchain. So great uh, sharing that experience. So we'll head over to Catherine to share hers as well. Thank you so much, uh, Sharon. Really great to hear what you guys are doing. It's, it's it really excites me because I think uh, what you mentioned about the fact that you know blockchain solutions are being built for Africans by non-Africans is a reality, and it's something that I think as Africans we really need to step up and say, listen, let's build the capacity on the continent so that we can build solutions to solve our problems. So in our company, VX Technologies, as I said in my introduction, we are a verified records company. So we are very much around or, or excited about the ability of blockchain technology for records keeping, it's used for records keeping. It is something that I find in, in my engagements around the continent that not very many companies are concerned with that. A lot of companies that are operating in this space are concerned more around DeFi and you know peer-to-peer -peer transmission of cash and you know uh, remittances and stuff like that, which is a very very important requirement for our continent. But I'm particularly and my my team in the US were particularly interested in the use of the technology for records keeping, especially if you consider that on our continent, data. I think data for Africans is something that is usually very disparate, very hard to come by and it can create a lot of problems for development. I look at a country like Lesotho where I'm originally from, for example, this is a very, very small country, one of the least developed countries in the world. And one of the reasons that this country struggles to get funding for either business or even so-called development funding is because it's so very difficult to find information about this country reliable information and i do believe that it's important that africans start looking at blockchain as a technology for records keeping to improve the information that is being put out there about us and about our needs and essentially how we can get solutions for our needs so specifically there are two two areas where vx technologies is uh, concerned about and these two areas are actually very close to my heart the first one is education. We believe that education records, if placed on blockchain technology, 
can really start to transform how Africans, especially young people in Africa, get considered and, and regarded by the rest of the world. You know that on our continent, we often have, you know, we hear of scandals around people claiming to have records that they do not have. Recently, there was one of a lawyer in, uh, in Kenya, I believe, and down here in South Africa, we get, you know, a fake PhDs all the time. And I know there was another one uh, we, whereby even the whole government of Nigeria decided to ban specific countries to say, listen, if you come, if you try to come into our country claiming to have qualifications from these particular universities in these in these you know, in these countries, and those countries included Uganda, I think Kenya was there, and I think Uganda. So quite a lot of countries because people are concerned about the amount of fake qualifications that are put out there and what this impact can do to the well-being of society. Here in South Africa, for example, we had a very famous case around the same time that the, the case of the lawyer in Nairobi came up. We had a very famous case about a doctor, someone who was claiming to be a doctor who was not a doctor. And you ask yourself, how many people in society are being impacted and affected negatively by such people? So in our company, we build a solution called AlphaDEP. On AlphaDEP, if you are uh, running an institution, an academic institution, or indeed any other institution, if you need to verify uh, credentials, professional credentials, if you need to verify achievements of any sort. I mean, in the US, for example, on AlphaDEP, we're seeing universities that are coming on board to say, hey, let's use your platform to keep records of athletics right because athletics is a big thing in that country right sports sports achievements so if you are a young person whether in high school playing football or you are a, a professional who needs to later on prove the prove that you own or you have achieved specific qualifications the best way to do so is on a blockchain platform because this can be verified anywhere very quickly right when we bring it back to this to the African continent, what are we doing in terms of that? My thing is living in South Africa with such a high level of youth unemployment. I believe that this technology can really do a lot to transform how young people in this country and the rest of the continent start looking for work. Because what you find in this country, and I believe it's the same across the, the whole continent, when you are a young person, you have qualified from university and whatever, now you're going into the job market. You're trying to apply for work. So imagine you're living in a small rural village somewhere because that's where you come from. Now, to apply for work, usually work is being, you know, you know, most of the work is found in urban areas, urban centers. And a lot of these young people now have to spend money, which they do not have, to travel all this way, come to the big cities to look for work, right? And when you come and you apply for work, what needs to happen is that you are uh, the recruitment agencies now have to spend a lot of time and money to verify your qualifications. If those qualifications had been uploaded on a blockchain platform and each of these students, by the time they graduate out of varsity, they have their academic achievements on a blockchain wallet, guess what? None of that becomes applicable anymore. All of that falls away. We now have a scenario where even people who are sitting in rural areas, as long as they have internet, they can be able to look for work using technology, similar to how you and I are speaking right now. I should be sitting here potentially applying for work at Women in Blockchain Africa, and you should be able to verify my qualifications simply in this very interaction. And you would be able, at the end of the interview, be able to say, yeah or nay, you qualify for the work, I want to hire you. I believe doing it this way is going to transform the look of our continent. It's also going to give an opportunity for young people of this continent who have qualifications to start looking for work overseas and start qualifying better for remote work, which is what, for me, that's the most important transformative uh, uh, impact that blockchain technology can do on our continent. So I'll leave it at that for now. I later on to talk about the other projects that I'm involved in, but I just really want to emphasize the importance of blockchain technology for records keeping and how that can transform the look of our continent, especially in terms of youth unemployment. Thank you.
thank you so much, Katrin, for that elaborate explanation as to what you do. And I think this is indeed really, really a, a very big problem, especially in Africa, that needs to be solved. And it's great to see that you are building a solution around that record keeping, especially falsified educational records. Politicians do that. It's very common in Africa. And it's great you shared some examples as well on how you are working hard to mitigate this problem um, with regards to records. Great uh, and amazing. So um, yeah, I think we'll head over to the next question. And I just hope everyone is taking down notes and um, is abreast with what we are sharing. Yeah. So um, the next, this is just an icebreaker question. And uh, I know you have building so many amazing pro projects right now and products, including businesses. But as it is now in 2024, if you were to uh, magically solve a one challenge that women, it could be in tech, blockchain, Web3 face today, what would it be and why would you want to solve that problem? So I'll start with Sharon, then we'll go over to Katrin. Um, uh, I think being Women's Month, um, this, this is something that we all relate to. Um, if I had a magic wand, I would totally eliminate the unconscious bias that exists within the tech and uh, in the blockchain space. Uh, you know, this bias is usually, it, it leads to women being overlooked, you know, underestimated, and it impacts everything from hiring to, you know, funding opportunities. Uh, apart from that, it even, you know, affects our self-esteem, to be honest, because, you know, it, if you know that, oh, you're gonna be a, um, in a room with a man, then you know already you know that. Oh, I have to work extremely hard, or I have to, um, you know, I I have to be more masculine uh, to sort of be noticed. Uh, but I've seen organizations such as Bitcoin Dada come up, and they are doing amazing work. Uh, I have met the most brilliant women uh, in the space from content creators to community managers to developers. And what I've learned is that we just need to be given the chance. Uh, you know, the unconscious bias does manifest in subtle ways, uh, such as like assumptions about our technical abilities, you know, how assertive we should be, or even expectations of, um, you know, our life our work-life balance and seeing these women they are you know they are out in this space uh arguably a male dominated space and they are doing amazing work and it's always nice to see uh the work that they are, they are doing um so it goes to show that we just need uh, a platform to showcase our work as well as um, sort of an example to look up to. Uh, that way, even young girls coming up can be like, oh, when I grow up, I can also be like, uh, you know, Catherine, or I can be a developer or a NASA, you know, engineer. Um, so yeah, I think that that is what I would totally get rid of. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. And that's really amazing. It's a very big challenge and problem. And that's why some of those communities, including women in blockchain Africa, we are doing what we can to um, bridge that gap um, with regards to blockchain as well. So let's hear from Katrin. Yeah, so I think for me, wow, if I was keen for a day, let, let's start first about women in general. If you will allow me, I want to talk about women in general before we speak about women in tech. Women in general, I would, and this will sound frivolous when I say it, but we need time. Women need time. And the first thing that African women need is proper drinking water that's accessible in their homes or at worst in their yards. It is ridiculous that in 2024, African women are still spending so many hours fetching drinking water. It is unbelievable. I actually did research recently on, on the occasion of Women's Day, International Women's Day, which was on the 8th of March, where I had uh, the occasion to speak on another similar platform like this. And it was shocking to me to discover that African women spend over 16 million hours 16 million hours per day fetching water. 
collectively. This is women in sub-Saharan Africa. This is women that look like me and you guys. That is shocking. Because if you think about the lost potential, the lost productivity that's sitting in those women's brains, and they don't have time to think about all the amazing things that we can be thinking about to improve our lives, to improve the lives of our communities, to improve the lives of our families. Instead, we are trudging distances to fetch water. So for me, that would be so impactful if we could just change that, if we could just get more African women, sub-Saharan women, uh, sub-Saharan African women having access to drinking water without having to spend so much time and effort and energy every day just to do that. That is completely ridiculous. And that is something that I do believe that we as Africans in general, our leaders, I'm calling on them today, please, we need to address this thing of drinking water. We need to address this thing of time that women are losing to such frivolous activities because that is time that is lost to them becoming the sharons of this world. That is time that is lost to them becoming leaders of this continent. They don't have time. They don't have time to go to school to learn these amazing technologies because they are busy fetching water. So coming back now to, uh, to the tech space, I think, um, and again, I'm probably speaking a little bit from a, a place of privilege because I happen to be involved with, with groups that, you know, uh, because I collaborate. I think collaboration is really my motto in life. And I'm always looking for, you know, to plug myself into, into groups that are collaborating with others. And I think as, uh, as the Global South, tech women in the Global South, we need to probably look for opportunities to foster more collaborations with those guys in the Global North because they have access to more resources than we do. So to answer that particular question directly, I would say we probably, probably a big challenge is funding. If we can have a lot more access to funding, we would probably see more women younger and even older like me <laughs> coming into the into the space because ultimately it's very very difficult to start a new business on this continent let's just be honest you know it's very very difficult to access funding because regardless how amazing a product you have it takes time to find buyers for the product in the meantime you still have to do what you still have to spend money on bills right bills do pile up so many young people or older, in fact, women in general, end up not getting involved in these spaces simply because these are spaces that cannot guarantee them a paycheck at the end of the month from the beginning. So I think funding would be a very, very big one. And I, and I, I believe, you know, Sharon would support me with this because at the end of the day, I mean, these guys that are, you know, you people, clever people who are, who are the devs behind these amazing technologies and solutions, they're not cheap, right? These guys, you know, need to be paid, you know, a, a, you know, quite a, a, a hefty bug. So if you don't have the money, if you cannot attract funding, and I'm speaking from a part of the continent where it is extremely difficult to get funding if you are just a startup tech entrepreneur or any entrepreneur for the more, you know, for the most part. So I think, you know, if I had that magic wand, I would swing it twice <laughs> firstly women need to stop having to go and fetch water that is completely ridiculous we need to have women able to have access to drinking water without having to trash for hours looking for this water every day it's ridiculous and then on the other hand i think i would uh, i would just make funding available so that you know, exciting, good ideas and good projects can be brought to life without those entrepreneurs having to now stress about where is my, uh, you know, my 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 money for rent or or school fees for kids and whatever going to come from. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Catherine, for that. And and I was really surprised with the uh, stats that you gave regarding the water part and also funding. I think you just touched a little bit on our next question, and I'm hoping we expound more on that. So um, let's head over to businesses or young women and ladies who are looking forward to um, kickstart their 
blockchain businesses and in Africa especially. You mentioned um, one of the challenges being funding and you also have a bit of experience in partnerships partnerships as well. That's for Sharon. How can these women navigate um, some of those challenges that they do face when building all of these blockchain businesses? And um, you might if permit to also share your experience in, in how, on how you were able to um, rise above or solve that challenge and getting um, to where you are now in your business. Yeah. Let's start with Sharon. Okay. Okay. Um, I think one thing I will always credit my journey to has been the power of community. Um, ever since I joined the Web3 space, even before I did uh, join the Web3 space, uh, there's always been a woman holding my hand beside me, uh, you know, leading the way. Um, and uh, I'm, for, I'm forever grateful for that. And you find that it is through community that you are able to find, um, you know, as Catherine told you, uh, opportunities are out there but uh, they're not as accessible as we would like them to be. So there's always that one person who knows a person, who knows a person, who knows. Uh, so yeah, the, the opportunities are there, uh, but uh, what I would say is you need to get yourself out there as well. Uh, use social platforms like LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, uh, that way you can always uh, directly uh, reach out to the people who you'd uh, be interested to, uh, with. Um, for an, an example is uh, t a, an event that we went to last year in Zanzibar. Uh, it was a, a startup that was coming in and they wanted help from the local community and uh, investors as well as the local government. Uh, we just reached out to them via Telegram and, you know, we told them what we do, um, you know, how we can partner. Uh, actually, one thing before I forget, uh, once you approach someone with a business idea or, um, you know, a partnership offer, it's always nice to, uh, you know, tell them what... <clears throat> tell them what you offer because as much as you'd like to be uh, assisted it's also nice to show your proof of work or you know some way that um, you can be at of, an ass of assistance because they are all trying to make it um there are also communities um that offer assistance in terms of uh investment opportunities um so it's it's prudent to know some of them, uh, but apart from that, there are also access to microinvestment and financial tools, and this can be facilitated through blockchain and fractional ownership of assets. Um, and this allows women to participate in you know macro investments and build wealth and secure their financial future. Uh, but apart from that, uh, blockchain based uh, financial tools can provide financial literacy and resources and budgeting assistance. Um, one tool that uh, I've seen work is the Gitcoin round. Uh, it, it works through a method called quadratic funding, which is people come and uh, you know donate to your cause. And once that's done, then there's a matching for these funds. And I've seen that work for a lot of projects especially ones that are not quite known yet. And maybe in the seed phases, uh, seed phases, sorry. Um, and yeah, such tools can be very helpful. Awesome, thank you so much for that. And um, you mentioned some um, organizations while you were sharing your experience. And please just drop that on the chat so that we don't miss out. You mentioned some like Gitcoin and some other organizations. And I like the part where you said networking and branding and joining communities, how they play key roles in um, making you get access to fund and navigating those obstacles and challenges that you might not encounter while building. Great um, one there. So we'll just head over to Catherine to share hers as well. Yeah, so uh, if I could just latch on to some of the points that uh, Sharon mentioned around networking, I think this is uh, probably a very, very important aspect that we need to, to teach each other as African women. 
to do better and do well, right? Uh, if you, I was recently looking at a, at a video by um, an interview of uh, Sam Altman, the, the CEO of OpenAI, right? Chat GPT thing. And, uh, you know, one of the things that he said, he said there are three important things to be successful in what you do, at least, you know, in as far as his experience with open, with chat GPT. And he said the first one is that you need to be focused. You have to be focused about what you're doing. I mean, I have to, you know, in 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 my um my spaces nowadays are known as uh, Dr. Blockchain because I literally I post about blockchain, I talk about blockchain, I'm always talking about blockchain. I'm not a developer, I'm not like Sharon. I mean, there is no way I would talk anything technical about blockchain, but I do understand the 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 transformative power of the technology. And as such, I then you know have assumed this persona, which is probably why you end up you ended up even inviting me to this space, right? because that is who I have become over the past three years. So you need to be focused. Uh, it's also about personal um, networks, he said. Uh, let me just quickly check. Personal connections is actually the, the term he used, which is what? It's networking. So I networking, I think many of us are never taught to do it well, right? Or do it at all, because that's not how our cultures work. And it's partly because of the, the nature of life that we live. Remember my point about that amount of time that's wasted fetching water, right? I mean, if you're going to have to knock off work and now go fetch water, when are you going to have time to go and hang out with Sharon and Catherine and have a cup of coffee and talk about blockchain? There is no time. But what I do want to challenge, um, especially young African women, about is the importance of using technology to network, right? Because many of them are on social media, but how many of them are deliberate about using social media to advance their networks, right? Sharon mentioned LinkedIn. I mean, I'm on LinkedIn and I can promise you, I hardly ever get any contact requests from women. It's mainly men. They are the ones that are coming forth and saying, hey, doctor, let's talk about X, Y, and Z. I want to connect with you. I see you're doing this. Can you tell me more about that? Where are the girls? Where are the women? Right? Why are women spending more time on social media, whether it's on Twitter, X, as they call it these days, or Facebook, TikTok, Instagram? How many of them are spending time trying to use those platforms to network and connect with, you know, with people that can, you know, empower them. More of our young girls are spending time on those platforms posting naked videos, right? That's ridiculous. So my, my challenge would be, you know what? Networking does not mean you have to have money to get into a plane to go to an event in Zanzibar, as much as I would love to do that every day. <laughs> but what if you decided to spend 10% of your time, whatever you're spending on social media currently, take 10% of that and use it to deliberately seek out people like Sharon, deliberately seek out people like anyone who is in the women in blockchain space or any other industry that excites you. The beauty of, uh, of social media nowadays is that you know, it, it allows you to, to post about whatever it is that you do. I know young women who are in hydroponics, for example. If that is what is exciting to you, use that time that you're spending on social media to network with those women and men even, right? Um, so I do believe that networking is extremely important. Hence, you know, what Sam is saying is about personal connections. And then the last thing that he says is self-belief. So he's talking about three things, focus, personal connections, and self-belief. To Sharon's point earlier as well, I think probably what needs to start being done differently or better is we need to start teaching girls to believe in themselves. And I think as Africans, most of our cultures, I come from a culture that promotes humility and it shuns 
arrogance as it's called you know if you are you know if you're a girl who believes in their abilities and you you know you you hold yourself up and all of that what do they do they push you down because they say don't be so arrogant you think you're all that and these are things i think as women especially those of us who are raising girls and boys i have boys it's important as africans we need to start changing some of how we socialize our kids it is extremely important to teach our children to believe in themselves to push themselves to have high ambitions and to be able to not be you know not don't be satisfied with what it is look for better because you are better you can be better and i think if we can do that as a society guess what i think we there is no way that this continent cannot be transformed for better because we will start demanding that of our political leaders as well. We will no longer be satisfied with a politician coming to you during election season, which is where we are sitting in South Africa now, now to promise us some, you know, a T-shirt and lunch at a campaign and think, yeah, now I'm going to vote for you. No, that's nonsense. I demand better. I demand better facilities, I demand better infrastructure, I demand better education, I demand better healthcare, I demand security and all of those things. But unless we believe we deserve that, right, hence the self-belief aspect. So all of that I think boils down to how we conduct ourselves in our businesses as well. So when we are launching a product or a solution, Sharon talks about the importance of talking to investors. Investors, my understanding, my experience, is that they buy you before they buy the solution. Is it not true? So if you come across as someone who doesn't even believe in your own solution yourself because you're so timid, you're so, you know, so intimidated the minute you walk into that room or in that space with that investor, you're already, you know, somewhat unsure. No one wants to back up something that is the owner, you know, of which the owner is unsure themselves. So I hope that makes some sense. <laughs> And I hope that's helpful. But I do believe, you know, there is quite a lot of layers in all of this. But we need to also bring back, you know, bring in. Hence, I like the idea of what you're doing, Sharon, about bringing Kiswahili, you know, our own languages into the space. Because our own languages are going to help us also better understand how we can promote better solutions for our own needs. Yeah? If everything is in a foreign language, Many people struggle to study or learn in that foreign language. So by the time you're translating and understanding what the language is, you're already 10 steps behind another person who understands the language already. So it is really, really important. And I think that's where a lot of some of these opportunities are sitting in terms of these technologies that we're talking about. We should not all be thinking, you know, hey, we see Facebook is amazing, so let's make our own Facebook in Africa. No, why do you want to do that? Do something that is important for your own people, for your own community, solves your own problems. Because the guys that built Facebook, they were building Facebook for their own needs because that is what that community needed, right? But they will not be able, hence my point earlier about collaboration, I want to keep on harping on this issue of collaboration. I think Africans, really, I challenge each of us whether we are in business already in this space or we're thinking of getting into business or, or we are just wanting to get work in this space. It's really, really important to understand that I think the world has now moved to a point where we need to collaborate. And Africans, everybody is looking to Africa to make money because this is where growth is still there. There's still quite a lot of untapped potential. But I think Africans need to think of it differently to say, hey, I'm not going to be just a recipient anymore. I want to be a player in this space. And the way I will play is by being a collaborator. And it doesn't matter whether you are a tech person or not. I'm not a tech person. I think it will come up shortly. I'm, I'm not trained in computer science. I did like the most basic computer science many, many years ago when I was an undergraduate. I'm a molecular biologist. So what on earth am I doing in this space? I am bringing a perspective that the developers need in order to develop and you know, build solutions that will address an area of my own profession that they wouldn't be able to do otherwise without my input. So I think that is quite important to also appreciate. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Catherine, for that um, 
insights. And I hope um, this, this for the viewers currently viewing from across the globe. I hope you are taking down notes and this is pushing you to actionable um, work, especially with the use like uh, passion writing missions, with the use of your social media, you now making sure that, okay, social media is not all about you just texting or viewing people succeeding or thriving in the ecosystem, but you also putting, um, taking that bold step to put out your learnings, to converse with people you see, you think and you already do see that are thriving in this ecosystem, getting to learn from them and conversing with them as well. So that was really, really great. Um, there and um, you also mentioned a little bit about the next question i'm going to ask um, about young women and ladies especially from those backgrounds that they are or community the rural, rural communities especially where they are not allowed to be outspoken or voice out their thoughts um how would you um what would you would be your advice and what would be the key steps to telling women, young women and girls who are looking forward to build blockchain businesses um, to who have these ideas actually. Uh, sometimes I discuss with some women and young girls who have exceptional and amazing ideas, ideas, but they do not have the push and the drive to just bring it back, bring it up live. So what would be your key steps based up from your experience on how to translate these ideas into uh, innovations and profitable businesses. So I'll start with Catherine, then we'll go over to share, um, Sharon. Wow. wow. <laughs> so, yeah, on that one, I think uh, picking on from what I had just said a short while ago is, I think it's really important for us as Africans to appreciate that we don't all have the same talents right so i may be very well spoken but i may not be an ideation person so that young woman that we are speaking to right now he she needs to reach out to a person like you to say exactly like you said they talk to you quietly in a corner they share their idea with you and you think this is brilliant but where it becomes iffy is they then don't understand that what they should be then conversing about is to say, please let us team up. Because I have this idea, but I'm not the best at selling it to the world. So why don't you join me? Or why can you not link me up with someone who can sell it on my behalf? So the idea, once again, of collaboration. But overall, I think as Africans, we still, let, let's remember, as women in general, right if you read the history of humankind you will always find whether it is in science or in literature or in in any any kind of advancement you always find that women have always been backbenchers right so some women even ended up writing amazing novels uh in you know under pseudonyms as if they are men because the society would not have accepted that novel if it was if they knew it was coming from a man so what i'm trying to say is that here i think as women as much as we want i'm saying we in this kind of group we say we need to advance women we need to advance women but it's also important to collaborate and team up with men as well I don't think that it's an, it's an either or. I think it's not exclusive. I mean, in my own business, I'm actually the only woman there. Everybody else is a man. <laughs> I'm hoping to bring more women. And what I have done, in fact, just, uh, just to highlight, what I have done successfully is I have been deliberate about making sure that the women investors, the shareholders that I have attracted into my company from this continent are all women. That one I've been very deliberate about because I could influence that. So I think it's also about those of us who are already in the game to really be deliberate about bringing women in as far as we can, but also acknowledging people's strengths and speaking to the strengths. Uh, if you look at back at my, uh, my own um, professional uh, experience, I've worked for some of the most amazing companies globally. And the reason those companies were so good is because they acknowledge the importance of speaking to one's strengths. So even in our own little businesses, I think it's really, really important to make sure that when we are recruiting talents, we look for people, we put people in their areas of strength. Because if you're going to put me you know, in an area where I am weak, the whole thing is going to fall apart. 
right? So this is probably at the level at which we need to start. But back in the home as well, those young women, fine, maybe they had not grown up with, you know, mothers and aunts and uncles that were promoting them as being good enough, even though they were girls, but they need to be deliberate about the next generation. How do we break the cycle, right? And I think this is something that perhaps two or three generations ago, Africans should have been able to do, but we didn't because of, you know, our own history and all the issues that, you know, our ancestors had to deal with. But I think we need going forward, we just need to be conscious. Sharon talked about conscious bias, unconscious bias earlier. We need to start being more conscious about how we conduct ourselves, how we engage each other, how we, you know, breaking down walls. I mean, I'm sitting in Johannesburg when I'm talking to Sharon, she's in Nairobi. There's no reason why Sharon and I cannot build a business together. None whatsoever, especially in this kind of space, right? So these are some of the things that I think we need to, to maybe, yeah, start uh, engaging. And let's not leave out the teachers because the teachers are the ones that impact our children and help them formulate who they are a lot more from a very early age. So if I had uh, that magic wand again, I would probably wave it on all departments of education or ministry of education all over the continent to say, let us start getting teachers who are accessing our children, especially girl children, but all of them, all our children, the teachers need to start teaching African kids self-belief. Self-belief is one of the things that I believe is missing quite extensively among African kids compared to kids from other cultures. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. Thank you for that. And one thing that stood out for me um, there was collaboration. So check within your network, those who you think are the outspoken type, those who you think are the perfect fit for you in collaborating to building that your idea, do well to partner with them and build with them as well. So great insight there. Sharon, let's hear from you as well. Um, okay. So one thing I believe is that women bring fresh perspectives and solutions, um, you know, in the blockchain space and, you know, the innovative space as uh, in general. Um, so, you know, you could bring unique challenges that, you know, we face and women innovators can, you know, harness uh, technology to address these uh, pressing issues and create businesses with real um, impact. So for that to happen, we'll need inclusive environments that foster, you know, female leadership and can drive innovation. So that means uh, closing the funding gaps, um, having more representation within the space, as well as uh, sort of mentorship and yeah, support within the space. Um, Catherine has already talked about support networks, and uh, you know, I'll talk about the untapped market. Um, I believe that the blockchain ecosystem in Africa is still relatively young, and if women you know get enough education about what this entails there's enough room for us to establish ourselves as pioneers and actually shape the space and capture you know a significant uh, market share um, sorry yeah that that is it for now uh but for the limited networking please please uh you know we are in a place where we are a phone call or you know a tweet away from the next big thing so i do encourage us to brand ourselves uh, i believe that most of us brand our companies and you know make it look good but we fo usually forget about ourselves um, myself included i would lie and we we can actually take advantage of you know our self-branding to put ourselves out there and you know get us ready for the next big thing um i believe there's also the technical skill gap um and this i would say stems from the cultural and gender roles that you know have been expected of us as women so we've not had much uh you know to look uh upon 
especially while in this technical space. But, um, you know, there are initiatives coming up that are, you know, promoting uh, and improving access to quality education in the technical space and training uh, is actually being included. Some are free. Um, and we find that these opportunities that if well taken advantage of can lead to growth within the space. Uh, Beatrice Builders does this. I've seen her doubt with this. Uh, Bitcoin Dada, uh, women, uh, women in blockchain, you know, that we are, sorry. Uh, yeah, so do take advantage of these opportunities. Um, put yourselves out there. I always say that uh, there's a, 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 a saying that I really like, clothes mouth, uh, clothed mouth do, do not get fed. And that is true in every sense. If we do not put ourselves out there, no one will know what we are doing. Uh, no one will hear us out. So we really need to, you know, put ourselves out there and uh, shout it out loud. Uh, just say what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Sharon. And thank you for that mot um, piece of motivation. And um, if no one does it, no, if, if you don't do it, another person um, had, um, unfortunately, would just have to do it. So if the earlier, the earlier you build that project or build that idea that you have, the better for you. So use this opportunity, put yourself out there. What's, what's the worst thing that would happen if you don't? So think about it and think about as well the best thing that would happen if you actually do. And the more time you take thinking about is this, is, can I do this, can't I do it? The more time you're wasting in translating those ideas into established businesses. So great one um, over there, Sharon. And you also mentioned, this is still, still on Sharon, you mentioned about the blockchain being um, in its early stages. And um, we'll just uh, chip in a question about many blockchain solutions, like you rightly mentioned, are still in their early stages. What are some strategies that you think African entrepreneurs can adopt to scale their blockchain vendor, um, ventures into um, wi for wider adoption? So I'll just re-echo the question again. Now, this is a little bit advanced. This is, is for people who are still, um, who just started building those um, their ideas, those innovative ideas. So how can they um, adopt or what can they do to adopt or scale those their blockchain ventures into wider adoption? Yeah, Sharon, would you want to speak? Um, I, first and foremost, I believe that building uh, solutions to local problems, that's always, uh, sh that should be a priority. Uh, I feel like a lot of people chase generic applications of blockchain, but once you identify a, a clear you know, challenge faced by your community and, and tailor your solution to address that, uh, I feel like that will demonstrate local relevance and also uh, attract like targeted users. Um, apart from that, uh, there's the UX, um, uh, or rather the user experience, uh, to be honest, blockchain uh, and everything to do with it is just very complex. Uh, so we need, uh, you know, applications that are user friendly and have uh, user friendly interfaces that are accessible, even with those, uh, even to those with like little technical knowledge. I don't need to know how, you know, my Bitcoin got from X to myself. I just want to receive it, you know, if I can do that through USSD or an app and make it very easy, the better for me, because I do not, uh, most of the people do not really need that whole technical, you know, jargon. Um, I think another one is to foster community engagement, um, you know, engaging with potential users, uh, experts within the industry or even stakeholders. Um, a lot of, you know, successful uh, businesses that ha I've seen build uh, really build on uh, users' feedback and, you know, build for the users' needs. 
Um, so building a community around the solution definitely helps with that, you know, gathering the information. And oh, this also does build and for, uh, encourages like organic um, adoption. Um, apart from that, I think I'll echo what Catherine mentioned earlier, collaboration and partnerships. Um, for, for instance, if you know someone wants to teach about the metaverse but i do not know much about the metaverse i can you know partner with someone uh from that from a company that does that uh, so yeah partnering with established institutions um can actually provide access to wider use uh, user bases uh also infrastructure and potentially you know unlocking some some of the hurdles that we might face within the um, ecosystem um, another one i would say is education uh, and storytelling um, so again i will say that uh, many people are unfamiliar with blockchain but once you educate potential users about the benefits and you know security if some of the some of the advantages of your solution, then they can use their success stories and real uh, real world examples to showcase their value proposition. Um, again, uh, one thing that I've seen happening and working is participating in accelerator programs. Uh, some some organizations are actually dedicating to supporting uh, African blockchain startups. So they usually like grant opportunities, uh, pitching to investors and participating in the programs that offer, you know, mentorship, networking opportunities and resourcing to, you know, scaling the companies. Uh, one thing about the pitching to investors, it's not always uh hit and win sometimes you have to hit and hit and hit and hit and hit until you finally get your win but uh that helps with you know getting your product out there you also get to know your products better you get feedback while at it um yeah and uh i i would say the last thing is to stay agile um the blockchain space and the tech space as a whole can be an evolving uh, landscape. So you need to constantly stay on top of things, whether it's the regulatory matters, you know, just be prepared to adapt your solution uh, based on any changes that might come up, uh, whether it is, um, you know, user feedback, regulatory changes, emerging technologies, you just have to stay on top of things. Um, I think that is what keeps some of these uh, products alive. Um, so yeah, that, that is it for now. All right, thank you for sharing that, Sharon. And I'll just hammer or hit on the last point she mentioned. While building, don't be rigid while building, be flexible, be open to feedback and build upon the feedbacks that you get from the customers from the customer base yeah so um, Catherine, would you want to add to that yeah sure perhaps starting from from the end we, we we sharing ended about the need to be agile as well as i think being flexible is important now Shay, it's small experience in our company so when we started our company in 2021 it was really around having built a solution that was going to help as manage uh, COVID vaccine um, records, vaccination records, <laughs> right? And uh, this was an amazing solution, which we needed down here. I know that in East and West Africa, this was not an issue. But remember, with COVID pandemic down in Southern Africa, we had borders shut, right? South Africa was in lockdown in all the countries around it. And I so happened at that time to be leading the COVID response program for the Kingdom of Lesotho. So my responsibility at that time was to help the government find ways to convince the Republic of South Africa to open borders to our people because Lesotho depends on South Africa for all its economic activities. And the South Africa was saying, hey, we can only allow you people to come in if you can show that you have been vaccinated. And that is where our solution started. 
But of course, when all the COVID mandates, uh, the vaccination mandates started falling apart, we had to pivot, right? So it's really, really important for, for business people to be willing to pay close attention to what's happening around them, which is what Sharon talked about, is you have to create problems that, I mean, solutions that solve problems, real problems that exist around you, not, not some imagined problems, because at the end of the day, I mean, I think all of us in this conversation, as well as those that are joining us uh, on, on other media platforms, we, we all have brilliant ideas. Let's just be honest. I mean, everybody has an amazing idea. And if we could all just make business out of that, we would all be millionaires tomorrow, right? But an idea is only as good as whether it's got a buyer. So if you have a solution that nobody needs, well, find a different solution. Firstly, find a real problem, which is what we call pain points, right? So in my in my um, kind of maybe latching on to exactly what, uh, what Sharon spoke about as well, about the problem with blockchain, um, I think the uh, approach with some blockchain solutions or blockchain companies is that sometimes they fail to un un appreciate the fact that they are dealing with new technology that many people don't understand. So when you come out and you are now talking to me about, hey, if you work on my app, you now need to store your 12, 12 word seed phrase. I mean, guys, what is that? <laughs> right? So it, it's really, really important to appreciate where the, the, the clients that you are talking to are in terms of their mindset and the way they think. This is what you have to offer. And that's something that I think in our company, Alpha Dev has done very, very well, is that we have taken a blockchain app, but we have managed to make it where I told the, the developers, I said, listen, I can't sell it if, it if I can't understand it myself. So what they've done is that they managed to build a solution that when you interact with it, and I have put a link to it in the, in the, in the chat, when you interact with it, you really feel like you're just dealing with a Web2 app which is brilliant. You're just logging in with an email address with a password like normal. Technology about security, about, you know, the timestamping ledger, all of those brilliant, you know, uh, um, features that I think, you know, attract all of us to blockchain technology. So that is extremely, extremely important. But also I think it's to understand how can you effectively multiply yourself as a small startup to get to the market, to reach the market quicker. And it comes once again, and I hate sounding like I'm a broken record on this, but it's all about collaboration. When you think about your go-to market strategies, if you have a mindset of a collaborator, you'll start realizing that there are pathways to achieve what you want that you may not have thought about before if you were not thinking collaboratively. So for instance, I'll share with you uh, very quickly. In South Africa, what I have managed to do for our company is that we have managed to go through uh, partnering with well-established big companies that are already providing services to the customers that you want to reach. So back to that issue about uh, education records, for example, you can understand who is the buyer ultimately. The buyer is not really the institutions themselves because there is no point in having one university, so the University of Nairobi being, you know, issuing blockchain, you know, their, their academic records on blockchain, whereas the University of Naivasha is not doing so. It doesn't make sense, right? Because ultimately now the students from Nairobi are still going to be expected to provide the same type of uh, uh, record uh, of the achievement as those from Naivasha. So who is the real buyer in this case? The real buyer is actually the government, the regulating body. Because the government is the one that has to say, this country moving forward is now going to start doing things this way. So how do you access the buyer? Right. So when you're collaborating, if you have a collaborative mindset, these are the things that you think about, and this is how you end up getting to your end goal. But remember, it takes time. Hence, it is important to understand how it is that when you are selling these solutions, do if you are not that person who has either the experience or the aptitude to sell in a manner, what I call consultative buying, I mean selling, 
you are a consultant when you are selling blockchain solutions you need to understand that you are really a consultant and what does a consultant do the consultant's job is firstly to understand the potential clients business if you don't understand that business well you will never be able to send into it because you will come up with solutions that are irrelevant to that business that's the first thing the second thing is to then understand what the pain point of your client is that way you will be able to address that pain point remember guys we are not selling apples and oranges here you know i'm not you know it's not someone who walks in and says hey here's an apple and i look at it and i'm like yeah wow that looks really tasty let me buy it no this is you know this is really a process that requires education to your point uh sharon and to that actually i think it's important for all of us as africans to start learning as much as we can about blockchain not necessarily to be developers but to just understand what this technology can or cannot do and to that uh, to that end i've actually also shared another link to to the bsv academy um website which is where there's a lot of material that anyone can just access just to learn about you know bitcoin about you know what blockchain technology is and what it can and cannot do you don't have to go there and become a technical expert but i think it's important because if we can do that more and better as africans we will also be in a better position to to protect ourselves against scams because there is a lot of scams in this space let's not forget that's why some of you guys are really really struggling to sell especially when you're dealing with you know financial solutions right because people will think oh no you're another scammer again right so it, it puts up a wall so i think education is extremely important understanding who your client is and who is the real buyer in terms of what you're doing because not everyone is a buyer to you and making sure that you have the right team to 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 take your market your, your product to market and uh and, and hit the right spots thank you thank you so much for that and i hope um so far we've all been um, having an amazing time here and we'll be heading over to the next section as we'll be wrapping up shortly but before then i will just check through the chat on youtube to see if we are all engaging and if you have questions, this is the time for you to ask your questions via chat and we'll read them out to our amazing speakers um, to answer them in a few. So while we are that, I will just be asking some personalized questions to um, our speakers here today. And I think I will get started with Catherine since she mentioned earlier about her background not coming, not being uh, in the computer science or in the having a technological background. So um, Catherine, would you want to share briefly on how you were on your background? I don't want to spill the, be spill the beans. I think you should just tell us well, uh, what field um, you got, you acquired your de first degree and your other degrees as well, and how you were able to safely navigate into the blockchain ecosystem, not only navigating into it, but building a business around blockchain. Yeah, would you want to go to that? Yes, thank you very much, Jeff. Very quickly, so I, I did my degree. I have my BA in biology and chemistry. From there, I went on to do my PhD in molecular biology, microbial genetics to be exact. And what I was studying towards my PhD was um, I was looking at uh, TB resistance, actually. So I was very close, you know, I was basically doing biomedical research. Uh, from there, I moved on and I ended up uh, in the brewing industry and I became a brewer. And from being a brewer, I became a, a, a seller. In fact, it was around the time of my being in brewing that I, I think I then discovered my real passion in life. And I think we haven't touched on that, actually, the importance of doing what you are passionate about. I think that is a very important aspect of success in life, right? And it's not all of us who know our true passion and you know early on sometimes you discover it much later on so i grew up thinking i wanted to be in fact i wanted to be a medical doctor because you know that's what a lot of uh, young african kids who are bright uh, tend to be funneled towards but i ended up a scientist and eventually i discovered my little passion which is selling technical sales 
So I started selling technology and uh, equipment actually into the food and bed space. Then COVID hit, COVID took me back to science. I told you a little bit earlier about going back, you know, running the COVID response program for the kingdom of Lesotho. And that's what brought me to blockchain technology. So COVID brought me to technology, blockchain technology. And so I think it's a very weird story, but it happened. And I think it's because once again, um, Perhaps another message I want to share with with our, with our listeners is it's so important to be flexible in life. You need to always be open to possibilities. Who would have thank it, as I like to say, who would have known that COVID pandemic would have brought me into tech, right? And I really just love what I'm doing. <laughs> so why is it important to be in tech? For me, uh, it's really about, you know, taking my experiences, my, my training, and now taking all that I know about science and research and medical science and health and education, because I also, you know, did a bit of uh, uh, lecturing at Varsity when I was doing my, you know, when I was doing my PhD, bringing some of all of that that I learned as challenges to those industries and bringing it to the tech people to say, hey, build me a solution that can address one, two, and three, right? And interestingly, part of that is also understanding, having been exposed to how governments do business, right? I also now understand how to sell to governments and how it is that part of our challenges on this continent is really premised on the policies that our leaders are implementing, right? And, and you will all agree that in this space, especially those of you guys who are in DeFi, right? Regulation is so important and it is limiting a lot of good businesses from moving forward because there's a lot of governments on this continent that are just like, no crypto, no blockchain, we don't like it, hey, 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 right? And all of us now are stuck. But it's important that those of us who do have access to the regulators, to the government body, start teaching these guys and making them understand how it is that this technology can really transform all of us's lives. So uh, <laughs> you see, I get really, really excited about that, that kind of journey, but that's what it is for me. And that is the excitement. Now, you know, with this new project that I have embarked on with this new smartphone, right? It's called the Phoenix X. Wow, it is so brilliant because we are now bringing blockchain into the hands of people, right? Africans have picked on these things. Everybody has a smart one, well, not everybody, but a lot of people have smartphones, especially the young ones. Now, if we can start teaching them using this very tool, I think you will see how quickly, hopefully, adoption will start taking place because blockchain suddenly becomes part and parcel of our daily lives, right? It's not something that is up there for only, you know, the Sharons and the, you know, the clever people to understand. It is part of our daily existence, right? And guys are going to start learning on these devices themselves. It's so exciting. And, uh, you know, we're having a launch in May here in Johannesburg, and I'm hoping to talk to all of you guys in the rest of the continent. If you want to bring this into your countries, this uh, blockchain smartphone, it is an Android device, extensive battery life, really built for Africa. Bring your, you know, bring your, your, your blockchain project onto the smartphone, because that way it's already in the hands of day-to-day -day use by our you know, our target market, I think that is just amazing. And that is quite exciting. And I'm very, very thrilled about it. So yes, <laughs> let me stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for that. And that's the kind of excitement you get when you dive into a sector, an area you are passionate about. You enjoy talking about it. It just flows naturally and seamlessly. So thanks a lot for sharing. And we're looking forward to the new product that you are about to reveal or unveil in a few. So let's head over to Sharon briefly. So Sharon, you made mention of the uh, organization that you currently lead at, Kam Kamusi Dao, how you are able to translate Web3 into Swahili. Would you want to tell us how it was like for you? I know you mentioned it lightly, and um, you would want to also talk about, uh, elaborate basically on the importance of localization efforts to driving blockchain adoption amongst women, not 
um, necessarily just women, but amongst people living in Africa. And there are challenges, obviously, I know you might have experience and opportunities. This is also for ladies or people who are looking forward to also like create this sort of avenue, but not in Swahili, maybe other local languages as well. So would you want to talk briefly into that? Okay, sorry. Um, so I am actually not from the uh, tech space originally. I actually did my undergraduate degree in psychology <laughs> uh, and now I am here. So I, when I was in, when I was in uni, I used to attend very, I used to, you know, attend hackathons and one hackathon happened, you know, to be on a solution that I was building for a mental health platform. Uh, while there, I'm, you know, one of the judges uh, suggested using blockchain for storage of data. And I was like, what is blockchain? So I started diving into, you know, the blockchain space, uh, learning more about it. Actually, that's how I joined the first community, uh, the first blockchain community. And, you know, from there started, you know, volunteering uh, from, for various, uh, you know, events events or anything that would require my volunteering. Um, so that's where I actually met the Kamusi DAO. Back then it was the it was an, an initiative by Region Foundation uh, to basically just break down uh, you know web3 terminology. So what happened is I joined uh, the company as an associate and you know I started you know, we now broke away from region and we decided that, hey, if this actually works for you, since you're new to the space, then, you know, it will work for everyone. Because back then I was fresh, um, had very little knowledge on Web3 and, you know, the blockchain technology. So they were like, if it works on you, then it will work for other people. And that's where I began my journey as a guinea pig. Um, so yeah, I would say that it has been an incredible journey. Uh, first of all, I, I am in this brilliant community and I don't know, one thing about the Web3 space, it is very welcoming. I don't know if they picked the best of the people to just bring into the community, but I just love the people you know here. Uh, but apart from that, it has been uh, it has been uh, you know an interesting journey because um, ideally Kenya is not the best Swahili speaking country. Um, so for that, we actually we actually had to find partners in Tanzania, uh, which majority majority of their people speak uh, Swahili. So we partnered with people there, and actually our lead uh, translator is from Tanzania. Uh, we've worked with projects such as the Mi Premier Bitcoin. Uh, Mi Premier Bitcoin is a diploma handbook for people looking to, you know, learn more about financial, in uh, financial inclusion and what Bitcoin has to offer. I suggest you go check it out. Um, the diploma is free and it's on the GitHub uh, repository. Um, so yeah, it has opened doors to partner with you know, people in different capacities. I mean, I've got to work with people in the metaverse space, NFTs. I mean, I'm learning so much, uh, you know, every day is, is a learning experience. Uh, sorry, um, you've asked about my journey. Uh, what else did you ask, sorry. Okay, so I mentioned that people looking forward to kickstart or build an initiative similar to Kumasi, what would be the, the first few things that they need to know in order to build such an amazing thing in, the, in also an, in, in their localized language as well? Okay, um, so I think one of the approaches that you need to understand um, first is the, uh, the environment that you're getting yourself into. Uh, especially the regulatory uh, environment, so that you you avoid uh, being on the right side, on the wrong side of the law. Um, you know, businesses associated with uh, blockchain or crypto can tend to be 
a red flag when it comes to government agencies. So it's best to be on the right side. Um, there's also, uh, you know, you should also tailor your solution to the use cases. Um, so, you know, if, if someone, you can't go offer, you know, a, a, a smartphone awards, what do we say? You can't go offer DeFi solutions to somewhere that, you know, doesn't have internet connection. So you'll either have to figure out a way to offer that, uh, you know, using using another way or, you know, create solutions like Machankura. Machankura uh, allows you to send and receive Bitcoin, but using a USSD code. That means you do not need a smartphone to do that. You just need a phone um, and uh, you can even use a feature phone to access it and you just need the USSD code and that's it. Um, I think, sorry. Oh, uh, sorry about that. I'm having a bit of issues with my uh, self, sorry. Um, apart from that, I think collaborating, uh, a lot of the steps that we've had, uh, especially within the space, has been through collaborative efforts. Whether it is someone who is looking for us to translate some some of their work, or um, you know opportunities to exhibit, <clears throat> um, I think that uh, collaboration and partnerships go a long way in supporting you know businesses that are up and coming. Um, also, building trust is very important. Um, you know, users are more likely to engage with platforms that speak to their needs. So, you know, building such a community is very helpful. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a, a simple user experience. Um, people do not need uh, the integrated in intricacies of how stuff happen, uh, stuff uh, things happen in the background. Uh, we just need, um, hey, so this is how your your partner or your relative can send you money from abroad to now Africa, and you can receive it within minutes. You know, and this is a solution for you know a situation where you'd spend maybe weeks uh, waiting for you know the banks to clear the the transaction <clears throat> um also i think effective uh, marketing and community building goes a really long way um as i mentioned earlier building a brand um i, I think that you know if someone mentions um mentions your company then there should be something that comes to mind um so that also connects you know the projects with uh, the audiences and hopefully you know driving adapt you know adoption adoption sorry um one thing that i've noticed especially within the blockchain space the documentation is very very important uh it could be the white paper technical guides or any resource that you have from your company i think that is very uh, very important and the uh, legal documents were were needed, and you know, in terms of service or privacy policy or other you know legal documents that are applicable to your company. Uh, so I, I think that's that's what I can say from from my end. Thank you so much for that um, insight. And I hope someone out there looking forward to build similar product or service as um, Sharon is building, you might have jotted and taken notes of what she shared. So uh, this will be the last question from my end before I head over briefly to the chat and see some of the questions you all have for the speakers. And uh, we will not end the session without talking about government uh, policies and how we could safely navigate or make sure the governments are in alignment to what blockchain technology is about. So I think I'll start with catering on this one and then I'll hold, help, help um, 
go over to Sharon to all, for her to also share her insights. We hear a lot of things happening, especially in the decentralized financial sector of blockchain. Um, I realized that Nigeria recently had a shutdown or ban of um, cryptos. No, I think the use of Binance in um, the country. And I know some other countries like Cameroon as well, they are not yet to fully adopt this technology um, in these regions. So my question now for Katrin would be, what do you think would be the best approach to integrating blockchain technologies into um, public policies and initiatives focused at fostering economic development and digital inclusion, especially in the blockchain um, sector? Yes. Yeah, so I think it's it's an extremely important question, and uh, it's what what I think is quite exciting is to see governments in different countries on the continent starting to actually be more actively involved in in perhaps not just shutting down the space because we don't want them to stifle innovation, but they need to get closer to understand some of these technologies so that they can open them up in a manner that protects the citizens. I will speak to Nigeria as a very good example because I, I happen to be one of the, the speakers that they invited to the NITTA conference last year in October. I think the Federal Republic of Nigeria is doing an amazing um, job in this space because they understand the need for there to be policy that directs how these technologies are getting into our countries within our borders and how they are impacting citizens. It is important for governments in Africa to pass the right policies to allow for innovation in this space. And the Republic of Nigeria, I think, is actually quite advanced in terms of that. And they are being paid handsomely for it because by you know, some research that I did last year, it indicates that by the end of November 2023, funding to startups in this sector flowing into Nigeria was getting close to a billion US dollars. That is significant. And the reason it's happening is because the government is taking the lead in making sure that they're implementing the right policies. I believe Nigeria is one of those countries where they even have passed a blockchain bill right that's amazing so laws are very very important because without the right laws we cannot then be able to attract funding for these startups that are operating in these spaces i also want to mention that um last year in june i was actually invited to speak to a, at a summit a four ir summit that was uh, funded by the african development bank so i think the african development bank is a very important um entity that those of us who are operating in this space need to get closer to because they are able to speak to the regulators and introduce them to these technologies and in that uh, in that summit where i was invited it was here in johannesburg they had brought in policy makers decision makers from 10 different african countries primarily countries of the sadak region and it was quite interesting to see how the guys and girls, <laughs> the leaders that are making policies that are directing all of us these lives. It was interesting to see how many of them really are completely ignorant of the space of blockchain, right? And they are interested to learn. So it is our responsibility. I think organizations like Women in Blockchain Innovation in Africa are so critical. We need to get into these rooms, we need to get these conversations with government and policy leaders to make them better understand the importance of passing the necessary policies and laws that govern this technology. What has been the norm in the past 10 years or so has been that guys are just saying, no, it's not allowed, we're not interested. And so, and that is not helping anyone <laughs> because that's how then guys go under, you know, under the table and do these funny deals and bring in these funny, you know, it promotes scams when a country is completely closed off to this technology. Whereas if the country is passing the right policies that are based on understanding what the technology is capable of doing within 
the, the limits of its own laws, right? It is better for everyone. We need young people. Digitalization is here. My view is that digitalization is the equalizer that Africa has been looking for. But unless our leaders appreciate that and do the right thing in terms of passing the right policies to ensure that innovation is happening at the right pace, because like Sharon spoke about, the pace at which these things are moving is fast. So we don't have time for policymakers that will take 18 months to pass a simple policy. There is no time because by the time you pass that policy, it's actually now redundant, right? Things have moved further. So it is quite important, I think, for, for those of us who are in this space and those of us who are building solutions to, to appreciate our responsibility towards educating the policymakers. This is something that I spend quite a lot of time doing in my space, in my business, in the countries where I operate. And it is important to also understand how we can look, we can work with funders, you know, the big guys that fund our governments, hence I mentioned the idea of the African Development Bank. I know that the World Bank also has a blockchain type of uh, uh, um, um, focus, you know, we need to know these people and that's where it's important the way, you know, the networking that we spoke about earlier came through and also, you know, the learning from those governments that are already advanced. And I always look at, you know, as I say, the Federal Republic of Nigeria through the, I think it's the, the Ministry of Communication and that NIFSA um, body there. I mean, <laughs> Kashifu happens to be, I guess he's my brother now. I mean, he and I are speaking, you know, uh, the Director General, they, we, he and I have spoken on many different platforms about blockchain technology together. And he is, I think he's really a very amazing blessing for the for the federal republic of nigeria and i think you guys in nigeria are going to continue to be leaders in this space probably followed by kenya <laughs> you guys are doing quite well the rest of us yeah we have a lot of work to do we are quite behind but we are hopeful that we will be you know you know getting more and more uh, an ear that wishes to listen from the guys that are that are responsible for making these decisions on behalf of all of us thank you yeah, thank you so much, Catherine, for that. Um, Sharon, would you want to also top that in briefly? Share your own insights to that. Um, so I think to answer this question, I will, you know, go back uh, to last year, where the Blockchain Association of Kenya filed a petition be uh, before the High Court to, you know, challenge the digital asset tax. Um, which was basically an amendment to the Kenya uh, Finance Act 2023. Um, so we all knew that the new regulation would stifle uh, innovation within the, the country. And, you know, BAK went ahead and sued the government. Um, so what happens within the regulation space is, as, as Catherine mentioned earlier, the, you know, the government, if it doesn't understand a technology, they first pause and sometimes they can actually ban uh, the technology and you know products that come with it. And then afterwards, if they they start learning a bit, they start you know loosening their uh, their restrictions. Um, another thing that I see is usually innovators coming up and just creating and then they say ah the government will catch up with us <laughs> after a while so these two methods sometimes work sometimes they do not because you know it over over a period of time it tends to create some conflict um but uh, as as i mentioned uh, during the finance act uh, they did not consult people within the, you know, blockchain ecosystem in Kenya. So what what happened is the regulators went ahead and created laws that did not favor us, that would put too much pressure on us. Um, I think one of the important things is for us, uh, as both the innovators and the policy makers, to just come together and, you know, co-create. Um, that would mean then we would need to educate the policymakers on what our technology entails and for them to be actually willing to listen and, you know, 
probably adapt this new technology. Um, so again, we need to think about why the, you know, the regulators do what they do. Uh, you know, they're protecting consumers, which is, I think, fa first their, their concern, and then also preventing things like uh, money laundering or, <clears throat> yeah, or data breaches, which are, you know, big issues within the space or even just in general. Um, so what I've seen work is collaboration, also uh, focusing on regulating activities and risks rather than the specific technologies. Um, so that would actually allow for flexibility as you know the technology evolves. Evolves, sorry. Um, also, I think the regulations to be should be tailored to specific risks posed uh, by certain use cases because not all use cases are as risky. As uh, Catherine mentioned earlier, DeFi can be a bit risky. So, you know, if there is a way to sort of work around that, that can be good. Um, collaboration, I've mentioned it before, uh, where industry stakeholders, you know, the technical experts and the civil servants now uh, come together to ensure there is an informed and balanced uh, regulation that, you know, reflects the reality and uh, you know, serves both both parties. Um, I I would also say that where possible, it is nice to work uh, towards regional harmonization of regulations. Um, so what I've seen happen is some countries cannot scale up because uh, some some companies cannot scale up to different uh, regions because of the regulatory differences. Uh, so this actually helps to facilitate uh, cross-border collaboration and even a more consistent uh, environment for businesses. Um, yeah, I think that is it for now. Uh, for Catherine, Catherine has mentioned earlier that Kenya is um, a, a good space to be in, especially in blockchain, and that I can agree that is so true. Uh, in fact, we have seen some of the Nigerians uh, come to Kenya and, you know, I mean, it's, it's a good, uh, you know, space to be in at the moment. Uh, that was besides the point. Um, but also something that is important um, to be implemented is the regulatory sandboxes. Um, so what a sandbox basically is, is, it's a controlled environment for testing new applications uh, for different use cases. So if you feel like something is risky, this is a perfect environment to allow for risk assessment and maybe even fine tuning of uh, regulation if it's uh, in collaboration with innovators. Um, the CMA launched a sandbox a while ago and you know, I would say some of the products that came out from it uh, have been, you know, quite good. Um, I think there's also need for capacity capacity building. Um, again, we do need to invest in the developing of the expertise um, of regulators. If these are the people that are making the laws, then they cannot afford to not know about these things. So. Uh, having law enforcement understand the risks and opportunity of the technologies can go a long way in, you know, helping with the adoption and law making. Um, as well, I think something that also uh, has helped um, and might help Africa's uh, regulatory ecosystem is the participation in global forums. Um, this also helps to share best practices, uh, learn, learn from jurisdictions, and ensure the consistency of rules where necessary. And I think, okay, the while drafting the digital asset deal, uh, the Blockchain Association did exactly that. They looked at different use cases in the in different parts of the world, and came up with you know the best practices, what worked, what didn't. And yeah, um, 
but again i would um emphasize on the importance of being flexible um regulation or regulators can tend to be a bit fixed on on certain um points but you know regulation needs to be adaptable to the you know rapidly evolving nature uh, especially in technology and blockchain to be specific so policy makers should be open to you know adjustments and you know different use cases um but apart from that i think um policy makers should consider maybe creating um incentives for businesses that are establishing themselves within that their jurisdictions um i think that would do, that would attract uh, talent and investment um so i think kenya right now is is doing that although they are not actively incentivizing um incentivizing the you know businesses just the fact that it's a it's not a hostile environment um has seen many businesses come to set up here um i think uh in the broader context we have uh you know effective blockchain uh regulations that should not be in a vacuum so we need to fit within a country's broader um, strategy um so let's say in kenya we have the 20 2030 goals that we need to achieve and if a business can come and show how you know the technology can help with that i think um that would help soften soften up some of the regulators and policy makers uh but you know from that i think um it, all in all i think having a healthy sort of regulatory environment does go a long way in regulation uh, in adoption sorry because i feel like a lot of people are more geared uh, geared can go towards where the government says yes and you know turn away from where the government is like no so um, yeah i think having a healthy environment can go a long way with that adoption thank you so much um sharon for that elaborate um, insight that you shared a while ago and so we are about to draw the curtains, but due to the time constraints, we will not be able to take a lot of questions. I'll just go through the chat and take one question. But then if you have other questions that we might have missed or we will miss, you could feel free to connect. They'll be dropping their social media handles briefly where you can connect and also ask your questions um, to them. They would definitely do respond as they find it. So I'll just take the question that I can find um, here. Someone is asking, what do you think about the pain in Africa? So I mean, I, I think the person means the decentralized physical infrastructure network. Would anyone want to take on this maybe like briefly in the next two minutes to just share your thoughts about the decentralized physical infrastructure network? Yeah, Sharon, would you want to talk into that briefly? Since this is a little bit like technical. Ah, oh, sorry. Ah, oh, yeah. Could you repeat the question? What is the one? Okay, so I believe this person is trying to um, begin a business around the decentralized physical infrastructure network. And um, she just wants to get insights as to what you think about it in Africa, operating in Africa. Okay. Um, so, yeah, you are muted, um, Sharon. Uh, if he needs to add or she needs to add a bit of context um you might want to also ask that oh sorry okay so i've heard of dpin before uh is it de and then pin is that yes. correct okay yes um so 
I've seen it um, used. So I'll explain what it entails. So it is the use of uh, blockchain technology and tokenization to build and manage uh, physical infrastructure networks um, across various sectors. So we can have maybe user own device like solar panels or mobile phones that uh, form the network's infrastructure. We can also have the decentralized ledgers for you know, data management and tokens as well. Um, so what is the question again? Yeah, I think you've answered the question. He, I think he just wanted to get tips on um, what it means and if it's applicable in Africa. Okay. Um, but, yeah. So in 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 Africa, I think uh, several. I've seen a lot of some projects being used. Um, one has been a decentralized uh, wireless network powered by uh, user-owned hotspots. Uh, so you have long range and low power connectivity for IoT devices. Um, there's also the blockchain-based platform for peer-to-peer -peer energy trading. Um, so we have like microgrid uh, management and energy trading in like rural African communities. Um, I think we also have uh, mobile token, uh, mobile tokens. Uh, which is basically building a network based on the uh, Cardano blockchain last I checked. And they provide affordable internet connectivity to underserved uh, regions. So you now combine user deployed nodes and partnerships with uh, mobile network operators. So I think some of the potential that it has is um, addressing the digital divide. Uh, definitely can go a long way in bringing affordable, you know, internet to, you know, to remote areas. And I think uh, that's like a use case that we need, especially if we are to uh, increase adoption of blockchain in, in Africa. Uh, another use case is the sustainable energy solutions. Um, I think it can facilitate uh, decentralized uh, renewable energy systems. So here we have like energy access and, you know, you can, there's the ending of the energy poverty. Um, another one would be, you know, economic empowerment. I mean, if you create new revenue streams, uh, so that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a win for us. Uh, but then again, you also need to have, you need to know what the challenges include. Um, so if you're not really technical, technically uh, empowered in that sense, I would say that implementing and scaling deep in solutions um, can be hard. Um, so maybe educate yourself and gain the expertise on that. Um, I'm not sure about the regulatory landscape uh, around that uh, situation, but maybe more research on that uh, can be helpful. Um, also, it's a relatively new space. So, you know, maybe having friendly uh, user, user interfaces and education can go a long way. So you need to learn about uh, these up and coming infrastructures, but all in all, I think uh, DP is promising in Africa. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, Catherine, you want to add something briefly because we have... Um, yes, they, yes, thank you. Very, very briefly. So I think, uh, you know, to, to, to Sharon's point, thank you for that uh, very comprehensive answer to the, to the, to the listener. Uh, I think what, what I really just want to add on is the, the, the fact that hopefully everybody understands why regulation is so important with deepens for instance if you look at a country like south africa where we suddenly find ourselves having you know very unreliable energy supply which nobody could have thought about 15 years ago but that is the reality so you find a lot of uh, people in you know better off areas you know who can afford you know we now have in, you know um, erected solar panels on our on our roofs right and as I'm sitting talking to you right now, I have 
energy that is being transmitted from my roof back into the national grid, but nobody's paying me for that. And, and, and the, the city authorities will say they will not pay because, well, the law doesn't allow them to buy power from individuals. The law currently states that individuals will buy power from the city, right? So it is quite important to appreciate the importance of getting the regulation authorities on board with these technologies to make them understand the power thereof and how we can uh, improve all of our lives. I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you so much for that as well, Katrine. And um, with this, we'll be drawing the curtains to today's event. Thank you so much for joining in. But then before the uh, closing remarks, I think I'll just chip in a quick question for our speakers briefly to share to the listeners, the female entrepreneurs looking to leverage blockchain technology to build scalable businesses in Africa, listening right now, what advice would you give them in the next two meetings, one to two meetings, you could just share that. So we'll start with Catherine and then we'll um, head over to Shara. For me, honestly, it's just collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. Network, find the right people who have similar ideas to yours. Find people, especially in the global north, who are looking to this continent, partner with them. There are many of them looking. And let's just make sure that we empower ourselves in the process. Do not just become, you know, a slave in your own company. <laughs> make sure that you bring value to to the collaboration, and you can you will succeed. Believe in yourself, you will definitely succeed. Thank you. Thank you so much as well. And um, Sharon, let's also hear from you. Um, I think I always yap about this, but I, I really believe in the power of community uh it has gotten me where i am and i've I've seen it work for different women uh in different areas uh but apart from that uh, i would actually encourage you to you know take the steps uh in you know just uh be put yourself out there uh whether it is you know a pitch that is coming up or you know regulators asking for feedback any way in which you can contribute please please put yourself out there uh always uh be on the uh, learning area sorry just be open to learning every now and then because the space that we are in is very young and as such there is new information coming in you need to stay ahead of the curve especially as a woman um someone was joking and saying that you know a man can go and blabber you know nonsense but a woman cannot afford to do that because people are more judgmental you know in some in some cases and you know as such we need to be better quote unquote uh than our counterparts because people are focusing more on us and waiting for us to you know, do, do something wrong so you know it's better to be prepared uh you know for anything that may come uh, apart from that just uh, be supportive you know if there's any up and coming uh you know people within the space just give them any opportunity that you can get um you know if it's mentorship if it's you know opportunities volunteer opportunities if it's employment it definitely goes a long way and yeah um be active um yeah and network 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 now that we all have like phones um uh, yeah go, goes a long way um that is it for me but up uh, uh, before I forget, I think the most important thing is to take care of your, you know, our mental health because it's one thing to work, uh, but then again, you also need to protect yourself because if you're not a, at a hundred or at least at an optimal level to perform, uh, then all that work will go to waste. Uh, so yeah, take care of yourselves. Thank you so much. Thank you. So thank you everyone for joining in into this session. I believe you have learned a lot. I have as well. I have learned more than enough. <laughs> so uh, thank you uh, again to the speakers who took our time to share with us and empower more ladies in the blockchain ecosystem and also inspire inclusion, bridging the gap 
in blockchain. Thank you so much to the speakers. And do not fail to connect with them on your various social media handles. Um, we will definitely do tag them on ours as well so that you could easily connect with them. And those questions we were unable to answer, do not hold it. Ask them via um, their DMs on socials as well. And um, yeah, Sharon, you wanted to say something? Uh, so how can a, a woman one who, who wants to join your community, how can they join Women and Blockchain? Yes, so I was just heading right into that. So um, definitely we will, um, in those that did register, we currently do have a Telegram community for African ladies and women in blockchain. You will definitely get a link to being a part of it. So in order to limit, um, avoid random people, including the men joining in, you will just have to fill a registration form. And then um, upon review, you will be added to the Telegram community where we have so many programs lined out for the forthcoming months in the year. So um, yeah, with that said, um, thank you once again for being a part of this. And the listeners too, we thank you for joining in and spending so much time as well. Do well to follow us on socials, connect with our speakers, as we mentioned earlier, in order not to miss out of some of the amazing events, programs, and initiatives that we'll be unveiling in the remaining months in this year. So thank you once again, and have a lovely, lovely weekend, and happy holidays to those celebrating Easter. Bye.